All right, welcome back. Hopefully everybody had a decent lunch. So we are officially done with our experience in the hospital. Yeah, we've got some some nice, some interesting experiences tonight and then some interesting experiences tomorrow that I have planned out. Um, I went ahead and sent the address of the high fidelity simulation lab uh, out uh, via text. Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Uh, so tentatively, we're still looking at, um, I'll meet you all at 1300 tomorrow, and I'll be sending additional information. I'm actually going to be there in the morning. They're going to give me the tour and we'll figure out how best to get you all in all that. So I'll have a, I'll have a plan that will materialize a little more definitively tomorrow. Um, so uh, I just want to talk a little bit about some additional information. And, and now that you have had close to 400 hours of, cl of clinical experience, um, at least most of you are right, right around there, approximately 400 hours, you've been able to kind of experience the spectrum of airway management and some of the various tools that we have at our disposal. And we're going to be talking about some high-level thinking, decision-making, and some high-level tools that as you progress in the field of paramedicine, depending on where you end up and what you do, you may have some of these tools available. Um, so before I start talking about individual tools, I just want to take some of these tools and, and kind of put them into context. What's the greater clinical context to think about airway management? And I always go back to the airway algorithms that we covered way back in um, airway management and pulmonology. And you remember the most important question we need to ask when we're confronting a patient, we're encountering a patient, is we need to ask, are they unresponsive and near death? Right? You have, you have an unresponsive, near dead patient, right? Cardiac arrest, near code, those kinds of things. If the answer is yes, that is a very special airway paradigm. That's what we call a crash airway, right? And if we're dealing with a crash airway, what is our immediate action? What's the immediate action drill to deal with a crash airway? Simple airway adjuncts. Good. Airway adjuncts, so we open the airway, suction as needed. Use appropriate airway adjuncts and do what? Ventilate. Ventilate them, right? Positive pressure ventilation with a bag valve mask, BVM, right? These are our immediate action drills if encountering a crash airway, right? So you, you, you pull up on scene, somebody is in cardiac arrest, that's a crash airway, right? They're coding, right? You need to open the airway, suction it out if needed, get adjuncts in, and then begin ventilating them manually appropriately, right? So that's the crash airway. However, if we're dealing with a patient that's not unresponsive and or near dead, right? But they have some sort of respiratory distress or some sort of airway compromise or there's some sort of risk for respiratory distress, failure, or airway compromise, okay? Then what we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, well, what's the best strategy for managing that specific airway, all right? And we have all of these various tools. Sometimes it's just as simple as positioning the patient, opening the airway, Maybe using an adjunct, maybe not. Maybe it's just as simple as positioning somebody. Somebody had a, a seizure, they're post-ictal, they're snoring, and you open the airway, you position it, uh, maybe give them a little oxygen, maybe put a nasal airway in, and then you just monitor them, they do okay, right? That would be a valid strategy for that particular patient. Maybe we're dealing with somebody having an asthma attack or COPD exacerbation. So they're awake, they're oriented, they're anxious, but they have increased work of breathing. What is probably going to be the best strategy for that particular patient? Position. Okay, position. You sit, sit upright, right? Position of comfort. What else? 
Okay, non-invasive ventilation. I think I even had that. Yeah, non-invasive ventilation as a tool. Um, what about medications? Huh? Yeah, Saba. Epi? Epi? Yeah, short-acting beta agonists, right? Right, Neb, right? Beta, beta agonists. Maybe non-invasive ventilation, and then reassess them. Right. Do you guys, you guys good with that? Um, let's say that you have that asthma patient or that COPD exacerbation, and you have given them rescue drugs, and they're continuing to deteriorate. Their respiratory distress is getting worse. All right, now what? Yeah, you've given them the salas and the mags and the decimatism. Maybe. Give them the whole gamut first. Maybe. What's, what, come on, what's your immediate action drill in that case? Immediate action drill, right? You've given your rescue drugs, the patients continue to deteriorate. Epinephrine, right? Epinephrine. That's, that's the immediate action drill for that, right? We're going to be in trouble if you guys don't, if you guys aren't good with there. Okay, um, so let's say you, you have a patient who um, has uh, urticarian hives all over their body. Um, their tongue's sticking out red and swollen and you hear strider um, and they're sitting upright and they're having respiratory distress. What might be the best approach for managing that patient? Epinephrine, right? Because we're thinking an anaphylactic or an anaphylactoid reaction. Okay, let's say you have a, a patient um, with suspected pneumonia. They're having respiratory distress, they're breathing rapidly, they have some distress, right? Maybe non-invasive ventilation, right? Right, maybe uh, beta agonists, if um, there are, if that pneumonia is maybe causing some bronchospasm or constriction. Um, what about a patient uh, with CHF exacerbation, who's, um, maybe they're having that scape you know, sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema kind of presentation. What would be immediate action drills for that patient? CPAP, yep. And what else? What other medications? So C Maybe Lasix? Okay, that's consideration, but there's actually another medication that's very helpful. SCAPE. Patients specifically. Mag. What's that going to do for someone having? This is cardiogenic pulmonary edema, right? Due to an acute exacerbation of their CHF, that activates the uh, RAS system, so they're hypertensive. They're constricted. <laughs> Nitro, right? Nitroglycerin, right? The, like these are the immediate action drills for skin, right? Non-invasive ventilation, nitroglycerin, right? Okay, so do you see how the tools are going to vary as to what you have? Let's say somebody has been shot in the face and they have loss of all their major facial structures and they're you know sitting upright and they're getting tired, they're bleeding everywhere and, and their airway is becoming obstructed. What there? Maybe moving directly to a surgical airway, right? Going directly to surgical airway may be your best option for that patient, right? You guys see kind of, you, so you see, you can't use every, it, there aren't any tools that work in every situation. It really depends on what's going on. Um, now, with that in mind, I wanna talk about RSI as a tool since we have encountered this several times in the hospital now. You know, and some of the procedures of the RSI procedures have gone well, and maybe some not so well. Um, and let's talk about RSI. So, first of all, what is RSI? What does that mean, though? Like, I, I know RSI, I know that's what it literally means, the words, rapid sequence innovation. Why, though? What, what's, what, what are you guys What's the benefit of doing I mean, kind of just quenching of the jaw, and you can relax, and that takes a little bit 
Okay, so maybe maybe it's to help optimize, make make optimal intubating conditions. Yeah. Avoid aspiration. Avoid aspiration. That's actually the reason RSI was developed originally. Because everybody's been in the OR now, right? Is RSI done in the OR? Anybody do RSI in the OR? Wasn't done, right? Now, things, there were medications given and preoxygenation, but was there? No, I didn't. Those of you that have been in on RSIs, on the floor, ER. in the ER, right? Was anything like that done in the OR? Yeah. Maybe it was the medicine, but not the. So maybe some meds were given, yeah. right? Okay. So RSI, let's just make sure everybody's good on it. RSI is a procedure that is done assuming that a patient is non-fasting. So you have a patient who has not, now <coughs> all of the patients that you guys who took care of in the OR, they were fasted, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. or 24 to 48 hours fasting, they had an empty stomach. So you were not giving large doses of paralytics to those patients where the anesthesiologist wasn't, right? They, they, were, they were maybe giving an induction agent giving them some inhaled gases. They weren't really giving paralytics, right? Uh, yeah. Every one of mine was. Yeah. 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 Every, every one of mine was. Uh, every one of them? Every one. What was the procedure? I'm just curious. Uh, so was it abdominal? Some of them were hernia. Yeah, they may have given paralytics, um, and that's because they're gonna put the probes in. It was a very sensitive procedure. And they're gonna the like the. Involved like uh, the ureters. Like going in okay, so you want muscle, yeah, they're, they're not giving the paralytics for the airway. That's what I'm, that's what I'm getting at. Okay. Okay. Right? The paralytics are due to the procedure, right? You don't want muscles contracting in certain areas of the body. So, right? That's why they're, they're not giving paralytics because of the airway, because of the aspiration risk, all of that. Really? I really even good class. I'm not sure we were paying attention. Yeah, we were paying attention. All right, so does that make sense? So rapid sequence innovation is a procedure that we do assuming a patient is not fasted, assuming that we haven't done a full pre-surgical, pre-operative workup on them. We don't know a whole lot about them necessarily, but that patient has some condition that requires some degree of advanced airway management, right? So these are the patients that are not crash airways, first of all. It's not a crash airway that we're doing RSI on, all right? This is somebody who has some condition that is causing respiratory failure, all right? And that can either be type one respiratory failure. What is type one respiratory failure? We talked about the three major types of respiratory failure. Type 1, type 2, and then a combination thereof. Type 1 is failure to oxygenate. Type 2 is failure to ventilate. And then you have a combination thereof, right? So type 1, these are you know people like with severe pneumonias, ARDS, right, where they they can't get oxygen in. And Type two are people who aren't ventilating, right? Their carbon dioxide is getting high. They're retaining CO2, right? Maybe this is a massive. Um, uh, there was that big benzo, that uh, benzo and alcohol overdose patient, yeah. right? And did they did they innovate that patient right away? That patient was there for a little while, right? Until they realized, okay, this is we're not going to be able to fix this. Right, we're concerned about airway protection, right? And that's the thing about RSI is rapid is in the name, but there's nothing rapid about it, right? It's not something that is that we just do right away. It is a procedure, right, where after thought and consideration, preparation, right, after all of that happens, then it is a procedure that facilitates successful innovation, hopefully, right? Safe, successful um, innovation, or sometimes not, 
There is also something called RSI, rapid sequence airway, where instead of intubating the patient, we're placing some other alternative airway, an LMA or a King, um, something on the lines of that. Um, and those things happen as well. So we have worsening respiratory failure, right? Because if this patient was, say, type 1 respiratory failure, this is maybe someone with congestive heart failure, you, in their way, right, their way can protect the airway, and you put them on non-invasive ventilation and they start improving, is that someone who's a candidate for RSI? No, they're getting better. We don't need, uh, we don't need to step up airway management. However, let's say you have that patient in congestive heart failure, you're given a nitro, you've started non-invasive ventilation, they're continuing to deteriorate, they're getting tired now, right? All the indications are this is somebody whose respiratory failure is getting worse and they're moving toward the next major consideration, airway protection. These are people who are not able to protect their airway and so we're gonna protect their airway for them, right? This may be a burn patient, right? Somebody who has airway burns and you get on scene and they're awake and oriented, they're talking to you, right? They're awake, they're oriented, they're talking to you. They seem okay, but they're coughing. They're, they have a lot of strider, they have carbonaceous sputum, they've got singed nasal hairs. You look in their mouth and their nose, it's all reddened and there's soot coming out, right? And their strider is slowly getting worse. Their work of breathing is increasing. Um, what does that suggest? Well, yeah, this is some, this suggests that this is an airway that's going to swell up. And maybe they're okay now, but in the very near future, they're going to lose the ability to protect their airway. Does that, that kind of make sense? Or maybe uh, you, you're dealing with a head injured patient. And, you know, initially the patient's awake and oriented to person, but they're kind of asking you, well, what the hell what happened? What's going on? You know, what are we doing here? Right? And then over the course of several minutes, say they are, they start getting lethargic and now they're not really talking to you. You have to, hey buddy, can you hear me? And, and they're kind of moaning. And then now they're only responding to painful stimuli and they're drooling everywhere. What does that suggest? That suggests they're moving toward an inability to protect the airway, right? So respiratory failure, right? Progressive respiratory failure, inability to protect the airway, and then Probably the most um, contentious one is clinical course. Right? Predicted clinical course. What, based on what we've seen so far, what are we predicting is going to happen with this patient? Are they moving toward deterioration or getting worse? Or are they getting better, right? And if they're moving toward deterioration and it looks like respiratory failure and airway protection is in this patient's future, we may intubate them, right? We may use RSI to facilitate intubation um, based on that. This is a bit contentious. Um, I, I think I've told you guys this story before, but I know a medic who um, intubated us, it was a child at a hospital at appendicitis, and they were taking this child to a larger facility for an appendectomy, and they intubated this child. Wake, oriented, tummy hurting, right? And they went ahead and did a full RSI on that kid. And do you know what their justification was for that? Did you say they're going to do it at the hospital? They're like, well, they're going to innovate this kid in the OR anyway. We might as well do it now. Does anyone see a problem with that? Yeah. What's the problem? Yeah, it's needless risk. And that's the one thing you need to think about. RSI. In any advanced airway procedure, it has some degree of risk, right? If it's just positioning the airway, the risk is going to be pretty low, right? It's not a whole lot of risk if you're opening and positioning the airway. There are a few, right? But if you are giving drugs to make somebody unresponsive, paralyze all their muscles, including the muscles of breathing, right? And then attempting to place a tube in their airway, that's very, very risky, right? So tools like RSI are incredibly risky. There's a high degree of risk. And so what we have to do is we have to go, what is the risk versus reward here, right? Is there a favorable risk-benefit analysis? 
to make us look at using RSI as a tool. Everybody, everybody tracking, tracking okay there? That kind of makes sense. And in those RSI patients that you've taken care of, a lot of them had situations that were, were getting worse or not resolving or could have gotten worse, right? Like most of the RSIs that you've been on were not like, well, yeah, I don't know. Let's just, what the hell, let's just RSI, right? Yeah. Um, now, unfortunately, a lot of those RSIs were probably a little hectic and a little disorganized, right? Some of them were better than others, right? Um, I think one of the better ones was one I was in on, a, on the floor, actually. It was, wasn't well, even in the emergency room. I was on the floor and actually it went really well because the team leader, the physician, was running the show, right? And was calm. I, you guys know who I'm talking about, right? He's a pretty cool, relaxed guy. Um, kind of had it, and that goes a long way. But what I wanna do is I wanna talk a little bit about the preparation and decision making around RSI. And so what I have is I have this RSI flow sheet. Um, it should just be one page. Um, I just double-sided it. And we've talked about this before, but these are the P's of RSI. And so when we get into a situation where we have these things going on here, and these things are not responding or cannot respond to our procedures, right? Right, so maybe somebody has really bad pulmonary edema, but they're lethargic and their blood pressure's low. Well, that's probably not somebody who's, who non-invasive ventilation is gonna really work for, right? So then you gotta start thinking, all right, they've got pulmonary edema, their SATs are low, their blood pressure's low, they're getting lethargic. I need to manage the airway here, right? I need to think about tools for managing this patient's airway, right? Might RSI be one of those tools? Maybe, maybe not. So what we wanna do is we wanna start with ponder. And this is actually a P that you are not likely to see in any of the textbooks. And I think this is one of the most important ones is ponder. This is that risk benefit analysis I was talking to you all about. So um, under one there, I just put ponder. All right, and so what do we wanna do? What is a patient's condition, right? What's going on with this patient that's making us think about taking advanced airway management procedures into consideration? B, hemodynamics. This is, a, this is really important. What is a big problem associated with RSI? And some of you have seen this in those RSI patients, their hemodynamics. Blood pressure plummets, right? They're gonna be at high risk for hypotension. Is this a patient who's already very hypotensive? Maybe, right? So might you need to do some pre-procedure stabilization of their hemodynamics? Mm -hmm. You might need to, right? Give them fluids, give them pressors, right? Or maybe RSI is just not an appropriate tool at this time, right? Maybe there are other tools I wanna to think about. Reason to consider RSI, right? Why are we considering this? And Pros and cons, why is this maybe a better tool than, than other tools? All right, time out and team briefing. This is really important, right? And all of you that have, everybody's been in the OR, what did they do prior to that procedure? Time out, hey, I'm the anesthesia provider, I'm the surgeon, I'm the patient, we're gonna do this, and this is where it's gonna be done. You wanna do something very similar to that, right? Okay, time out everybody. We're thinking about RSI. I want you to be on the monitor. Can you do IV and meds? Can you have the backup airways ready to go? Can you uh, go ahead and start pulling up equipment for me and maybe assess a patient? Is everybody okay with that so far? Yeah, right? So we just took a timeout, right? You just, you're kind of a divide and conquer there. All right. And then what we want to do is we want to gather information, right? We want to identify factors that are going to potentially complicate the procedure. So difficult airway, you guys know this well, the lemons exam, right? 
So look the patient over for anything obvious. 332 rule. What is the 332 rule? Yeah. It's not okay. I've been sending some of your charts back because you guys are writing good or okay. Like, what does that mean? So three is, can you open, can the patient put three fingers in their mouth? Right? That's the three. What's the second three? Can you fit three fingers in the lower jaw? Does, does the jaw come out enough, right? And then what's the two? Two fingers on top of the thyroid cartilage, right? Three, three, two rule. All right. Uh, the next is a malum potty. Everybody okay with a malum potty score? Right? Uh, ideally, you want the patient sitting up, right? You want to look at them. Hey, say ah. Open your mouth and say ah. Look and see what you can see, right? One through four. Um, obstructions or obesity, right? It is neck mobility. How do we assess neck mobility? Chin to chest, right? So that's hyper. It's chin to chest, hyper flexion, and then hyper extension. Awesome. And then pre procedure saturations. Where is this patient saturated? If they're saturating at 78%. Do we have any business even considering RSI? No, we need to get those. Now, might RSI be a consideration later on? Maybe, we need to get those saturations up. Does that make sense? So we need to get those saturations up, do things to get the saturations up, and now it's like, okay, right? Is RSI on the table? Factors for difficult mask ventilation, right? Because that's our primary backup, but things don't go well, right? Our primary backup is positive pressure ventilation of the back valve mask. So, um, factors that um, are difficult for the mask seal. Think of moans. So M is what? Mask seal. Are there things, obvious things, that are going to prevent getting a good mask seal? Like a big old beard, right? That would be kind of an obvious one. O is obstructions or obesity. We talked about that already. A is extreme of age, generally over 55. In no teeth, right? That, that can make it very difficult to get a mask seal. And then S, think of stiff lungs or stiff airway, right? So ARDS, severe pulmonary edema, circumferential chest wall burns, severe thoracic uh, trauma or trauma to the airway, severe obstructive disease, those kinds of things. All right, so you do that. What's going on with the patient? Risk benefit analysis, and then you make a decision. What are we going to do? Is RSI a good procedure given what we're dealing with? Does that make sense? And that's clinical decision making on your behalf. So if we decide that RSI is, is, is a good procedure, this is where the more traditional P's come into play. So we've pondered, now we're going to prepare. All right, so what do we need to prepare? Well, good old soda, right? And do you want to be doing this before or after meds have been given? It's all needs to be done before, right? There is nothing rapid about RSI until the drugs are given. And then things happen very rapidly, for better or for ill. You guys okay with that there? Things are going to happen very rapidly, but up until the point where those meds are given, it should be a deliberate, planned out, well-documented, well-communicated procedure among your team. So, prepare. You want to have your suction on, you want to have it connected, you want to have it readily available. Oftentimes, you'll slide the catheter underneath the, the, the patient's shoulder. So it's right there, underneath that right shoulder. You have that suction right there. All right? Then what? Oxygen delivery devices, readily available. That means what? BVM, you need to have nasal cannula on that patient, and you need to have nasal cannula at 15 liters a minute. High flow nasal cannula, right? Yeah. Or if you have high, you know, like vapotherm, you, you can do that, but just nasal cannula, 15 liters, and then maybe put a, right, a non rebreather on top of that. All right? If the patient um, is on non invasive ventilation, can you use non invasive ventilation? as your pre oxygenation strategy, CPAP or BiPAP. Yeah, right? Just go to the ventilator, go to your machine, turn up the FiO to 100%. Right? You, you can absolutely do that, right? 
got them on CPAP or BiPAP, but they're continuing to deteriorate, we're gonna keep them on that while we prepare for RSI. That's perfectly acceptable um, there. All right, drugs pre-dawn, labeled, and readily available. Now, this is one area where we've kind of gotten spoiled because in the hospital, who, who goes to every code, every RSI, every rapid response? Pharmacy. Pharmacy, right? And they're there with the drugs. We don't necessarily have that. <laughs> so you need to designate somebody. So what I've done is I've made a form for you all. You see this form here? So whoever's responsibility, whoever's doing the IV and meds, your responsibility is going to be to draw those meds up. And so I've made this cool form here. So what's a patient's weight? Kilograms. Do they have any allergies? Are there any risks for significant medication interactions? Right? Um, and is there any history of malignant hyperthermia, if we know that or not, right? Because there are certain drugs like succinylcholine where we would want to avoid that at all costs if we're worried about malignant hyperthermia. And then what I have is I have the most common induction agents and paralytics in this little table here. So we've got atomidate, ketamine, rocuronium, and succinylcholine. So what you're gonna do is, you're gonna calculate how much to give, right? But that's not the end of it. Oh, great, I know how many milligrams to give. What does that mean at the end of the day? Nothing. You need to actually draw it up, right? So um, what I've done is um, these are the concentrations of those agents that you will be using over the next couple of days. And so the Tomidate, I give you the dose, calculate the dose, and then calculate the volume that you need to draw up, right? And then double check. What I would recommend is if you find yourself in an RSI procedure and you're doing the drugs, take this form, put it down for that patient, select the drugs that you're gonna draw up, draw the drug up, put the label on that drug, right? And then put that drug right there on the form, right? So if you're gonna give a Tomidate, you draw the Tomidate up, label it, and the Tomidate's right there. Does that make sense? And then if you're gonna give um, rock uranium, you draw the rock uranium up, label it, and have the rock uranium right there. All right, team leader, I have got this many milligrams of uh, atomidate, this many milligrams of rock uranium ready to administer. Let me know when you want me to give those. Okay, hold off. We're still pre -oxygen. I'm holding off. You, you good with that there? So you have those drugs, right? So suction, oxygen, airway devices, and drugs. Um, other medications that you want to have pulled up. Not only do you want to have your induction, your paralytic, but you want to have push dose pressors, at least. Because we know hypotension is such a problem with RSI, right? So I would also, if you're the med person, you're going to want to mix push dose pressors, right? Everyone remember how to do that? You just draw one milliliter of epinephrine one to 10,000 in a nine milliliter syringe of normal saline, and that gives you 10 milliliters of push dose epinephrine, right? And that is a concentration of what? 10 micrograms per milliliter, right? And then you can give one half to one milliliter every three to five minutes, right? Or five to 10 micrograms. Have that pre-drawn and ready to administer, right? Um, let's see here. Uh, have your IVs in, probably two IVs, have the fluids up and ready to um, open wide if, if you need to, all right? Always prepare your airways and you want a size larger and smaller than you need. And you also wanna have your backup plan. You wanna have a double backup plan. So if we're gonna go with RSI, RSI is your primary plan, right? What is your alternate if, they, if you get in trouble during RSI? Yeah, your alternate is this stuff here, right? Adjuncts and positive pressure ventilation. So primary, we've decided to RSI, and okay, um, I got in, I can't see much, there's some secretions, saturations are falling. So alternate plan is what? 
open the airway, get an adjunct suction, start bagging them, right? Or ventilating them with a bag valve mask. All right, so that's our alternate plan. What's our contingency? Generally, it's going to be a supraglottic airway of some sorts. And what's our emergency plan? Surgical option, right? You guys remember talking about pace planning? So that's the pace plan for RSI right there, right? But guess what? You want to have all that ready to go, right? So whoever is gathering the airway equipment, that's right. You want to have the supraglottic, not just the package, right? You want to take it out, have it ready to go. You want to have the surgical airway kit out, right? You want to identify landmarks, maybe even draw on the patient's neck with a, a Sharpie, right? Wipe their neck down with some alcohol or some betadine, right? Have it pre 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 prepped. That way, if you need to transition, right, you save yourself time. You can just seamlessly transition into that option. Does that does that kind of make sense? You want to have a uh, you want to have an endotracheal tube, larger and smaller than you think you might need. You want to have um, um, maybe some blades, larger and smaller than you think you might need, or maybe a different blade, or right, a Mac and a Miller, right. You want to have your bougie. You want to have all of that ready to go, right? You want to test the uh, endotracheal tube that you're going to use. You want to have a bougie there, stylite if you're using that. You want to have all that ready to go. So while you're preparing, while that's being prepared, you want to position the patient. Uh, optimal position is upright, 20 to 30 degrees, right? So you don't want them completely supine. You want them upright a little bit, and you want to align the airway axes, head tilt, chin lift tad under the shoulders. Everybody okay with that there? So you're going to do that and then you're also going to pre-oxygenate the patient. Nasal cannula on, running 15 liters per minute, non-rebreather mask on top of that, or you might use non-invasive ventilation if there's an indication for that. And optimally or ideally you want to pre-oxygenate that patient for at least three minutes prior to the procedure and what are we doing with pre-oxygenation. What's the whole goal of pre-oxygenation? Move in the right direction. So the main goal is to get rid of all the nitrogen in their lungs, right? That's called the functional residual capacity, the FRC, right? Um, you want to replace all the nitrogen with oxygen. That way when they're apneic, there is oxygen that is still diffusing into their bloodstream. Now, is carbon dioxide going to build up while they're apneic? Mm -hmm. Yes, right? So they're going to get hypercapnic. That's okay, right? Because we'll deal with that once we get the um, airway in place. But you want to have a oxygen gradient. Um, and, of course, you need your saturation as high as you can get. Um, optimally, you'd like the saturation at 100%, right? Um, absolutely, you don't want those saturations um, any lower than 90%. But if you're trying, if you're going to RSI somebody and all you can get up to is 90%, that's a real precarious situation, right? Because once saturation drop below 90%, you don't really have any business being in the airway. You really don't. Right. And then premedication. Do we necessarily have to premedicate patients? Yeah, remember the load mnemonic, right? So, lidocaine, not often used anymore. We used to say if, if you have a tight head or tight lungs, you give lidocaine, right? So if they have a head injury, asthma, COPD, things like that, we give lidocaine. Um, there's not great evidence that it really do, does anything. Um, opioid is the O, right? Fentanyl is the most commonly used pre-medication agent. Is that reasonable to think about giving some fentanyl for pre-medication? It actually is, right? Again, though, if you're going to do it, you need to give it three minutes prior to giving the induction agent in the paralytic, right? Otherwise, you're not really doing much for the patient during the procedure. Um, atropine um, or glycopyrrolate. It's not commonly used, but why? What, what might atropine or glycopyrrolate be used for? Or what are they commonly used for? Reimbursement of vagal movement. So if there is some vagal tone that happens during intubation that causes bradycardia, atropine may um, help with that. It's not super common, 
Um, but there's actually another reason that might be more common with us, given some of the drugs we use. Um, so partial reversal of some of the effects of some of the paralytics. <laughs> um, yeah. The mainly the cholinergic effects. But yeah, the actual paralytic, there are actually reversal agents out there, like Sugamidex, if you want complete reversal. Um, but atropine or glycopyrrolate, they're drying. They're anticholinergics. They dry people out. Are there drugs that we give that can make people really wet and sticky? Their airways. Which one in particular? It's an induction agent, commonly given. And a common side effect of it is hypersalivation. Oh, so ketamine. ketamine, right? Ketamine, that's a common side effect. That means you get hypersalivation. So they start salivating after you give the ketamine, right? Or you're worried about them salivating, you might premedicate them with atropine or glycopyrrolate. Again, you got to give it three, three, three minutes prior to the procedure, so it's not often used, but it's just a consideration. And then the D uh, and the load is a defaciculating dose. This is only if you're gonna use succinylcholine. And even then, this is not often done. And essentially what you're doing is, you're going to give 10% of the full dose of succinylcholine prior to giving the full dose. And the reason being is, um, what happens when succinylcholine is given? What can happen? It causes fasciculations, right? The patients can kind of twitch a little bit. And the, the, those fasciculations can be painful, um, and they might increase intracranial pressure, they might increase the risk of aspiration, things like that. And so the thinking is, is if we give a small priming dose, so 10% of the full dose, we can kind of block those fasciculations. Um, Again, it's not commonly done because are we, so first of all, are we commonly using succinylcholine? Those of you that um, have been in RSIs, has succinylcholine been commonly used? No, what are we typically using? Things like rocuronium, right, non-depolarizers. We're using large doses of things like rocuronium. So the fasciculations is not a, a problem. There are some other drugs that can cause muscle jerking, like uh, Atomidate. I know a couple of you run into that where Atomidate was given and there was some jerking, some myoclonic jerking. Um, so you can get some of that with, with Atomidate. Okay, and then once we've done all of that crap, right? Now this is where the, the rapid happens. So what do we do? We're prepared, everything's out, the meds are pulled up, the patient's pre-oxygenated, everybody knows what we're doing. You got the patient, uh, you got a person monitoring the saturation, they'll let you know when the sats um, fall below uh, 90%. Um, so have them call out. Do you want to necessarily have them call out the saturation in real time? Sats are 99%. No. 98%? No, no right? I, I don't even know that, it's just extra stress. Let me know when, it's, when it hits 90% so we can change our plan, right? Designate someone to do that. Designate your rescue team to come in and rescue you um, with your, your backup option. Because sometimes if you're doing the intubation, you can get very tunnel vision and you might need someone to come in, hey, hey man, we gotta get out of this airway. Let's start backing the patient up. So having someone to come in that's kind of your, your, your backup team. So you paralyze, but induce first. So you give the induction agent, be it uh, ketamine or atomidate, and then you follow that up with the paralytic. Not, never the other way around, right? You never want somebody paralyzed that doesn't have an induction agent on board, right? Everybody okay there? Um, and then what do you do? You pass the tube and prove placement. You want to know the size and depth of insertion, objective and subjective methods to verify placement. So what's the gold standard objective method? Right? Yeah, capnography, right? And then all the other methods, subjective, right? Chest rise and fall, long sounds, misting of the tube. These are subjective and not as reliable, right? Um, so you need to be using carbon dioxide monitoring. All right? Number of attempts. What did you change between attempts, right? 
you attempted to innovate and something happened, you had to back it back up. You need to change your strategy, right? You can't go in and do the same thing, right? Maybe, oh, I needed a suction or secretions or, uh, you know what, I wanna use a smaller tube um, on this one or I wanna reposition the airway this way on this, right? You just can't keep doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and then any difficulties encountered during that, that innovation, the POGO score. Everyone remember what POGO stands for? Percentage, Percentage of glottic opening. Um, sometimes we refer to this as a Cormac and Lehane <laughs> score. Right? This is what the glottis actually look like, right? And it's similar to the Malampati score, and it's a one to four, right? One is you see everything. You see the arachnoid cartilage, you see the corniculate cartilage, you see the vestibular folds, you see the esophagus, you see the glottic aperture, right? You see the whole thing in all of it, the whole glottic, glottis in all of its glory. And then a Cormac and Lehane grade four is you see nothing, right? You see tongue and esophagus, and you cannot locate any glottic structures. Right? Grade three is you can um, locate the uh, posterior aspects of some of the cartilage, you know, the corniculate and the cuneiform cartilages, um, right? That would be a three. Two, you can see some of the cartilage. Um, so you can see the corniculate, the arachnoid cartilage, the arachnoid notch, but you, you can't um, identify the um, uh, the epiglottis, right? And then two um, is um, a much, even uh, more structures visualized there. All right? And then once the tube's in place, that's not the end of the story, right? Because now we need to manage that patient. So we need to move into post-intubation management. So what's your ventilator management strategy? What's your ongoing pain management strategy? Remember, the induction agents are short acting, right? The patient still has a tube in them, the patient still has some other problem that we innovated them for. Are we going to need to give pain medicines in route, right? <clears throat> Things like fentanyl and morphine. Uh, maybe some sedation, right? Our sedatives, our benzodiazepines going to help with pain? No. no, right? They may make the patient look sedate, right? But remember, there are physiological responses to pain, and intubation is actually very painful, right? Um, so don't forget, just because you've given somebody a bunch of um, midazolam and they look comfortable, they may not be, right? The heart may, they may be tachycardic, they may be having a sympathetic response. Um, so you want to make sure that you're providing good analgesia and good sedation, right? If, if needed, if needed, all right? Hemodynamic support. This is important because oftentimes they can get hypotensive here. So how are we going to support their blood pressure if that happens, right? Are we going to get fluids? Are they candidate for fluids? Are they volume depleted? Maybe we've been given fluids the whole time, right? In some of the RSIs you all have done, right? They've had fluids wide open, right? During that procedure because of, of the risk or maybe the patient was already coming in um, hypotensive. Um, inline suction. Everybody is, should be very comfortable inline suction, right? The Ballard system, right? You have the ability to do it, get that inline suction on because you can suction the patient so much easier than having to break the circuit with our standard um, flexible catheters. Uh, gastric innovation, right? We need to get a gastric tube in them, suction their stomach out, right? That decreases the risk for aspiration, makes it easier to, to ventilate them. They don't, they don't have a full stomach full of stuff, right? And then hypothermia prevention. They've been paralyzed, so their muscles aren't working, which means what? They're not making heat. They can't shiver. Thermogenesis is impaired, and they're going to be at high risk for hypothermia. So we need to get them covered up, keep them warm. And their underlying problem may make them higher risk for hypothermia, particularly if it's trauma. And that's kind of the way of looking at RSI. So with that in mind, are there any questions? Could warm fluid be considered for that as well? Absolutely. You have, you have fluids on a warmer? Absolutely. Give them warm fluids. Give them, you know, that they can tolerate it. Excellent. So what I've done is I actually made up an advanced airway bag for you all. And you will be using this uh, tomorrow during your scenarios. And so the third form, so this form is to help the team leader, the various team members, know what they need to do, how to assess and how to think. This is to help the person with medications, right? And you want to determine 
right, during the preparation for step, what induction agent are we going to give? What paralytic are we going to give? And is there any need for any premedication at all, right? Remember, premeds, they need to be given early, right, if you're going to go with it. Um, I don't have pre-med agents on here. I just have uh, common paralytics and induction agents. And then the third one is the inventory for the bag. So this is what should be in that advanced airway bag that you all are, are, are using. So what I would recommend is while you're waiting to do scenarios this afternoon or grow brilliantly this evening, what I strongly suggest is for you to go through every area of this bag, familiarize yourselves with it, and then what I would suggest is, I would suggest that you do some dry runs, right? You do some dry run RSI. I've got a mannequin in here, right? And so what you can do is you can kind of practice with your team, okay, I'm the team leader. Who, who's gonna do what if, if this happens, right? possibly tomorrow maybe. Um, who's going to do what? Dry run things, practice getting into and out of the bag. I'm just going to familiarize you with it and then you can go through the list and all of its glory. So this bag has two major compartments. It has these outer compartments and you can see that they're labeled one, two, and three. Everybody see that on their list there? Right. So compartment one, this contains your gastric intubation supplies. So this contains a tummy syringe and this contains the gastric tubes. Okay, what's two? What's compartment two? BBM, PP valve. Okay, BBM, PP valve, and huh? And your superglottic option, right? In this case, it'll be an eye gel and of course carbon dioxide detector. <laughs> And then next is this compartment three here. So compartment three contains your oral airways, a nasal airway, 10 milliliter syringe, your suction, lubrication, stat pads. Because you want these patients on the monitor, right? You want them on the monitor, you want frequent, you want Q, at least Q5 blood pressure check. Um, you will have four bags of fluid, one, two, three, four. You will have nasal cannula and a non-rebreather mask or something that kind of looks like an honor of Everybody good with that? All right. The next compartments are going to be deeper in the bag. So you've got intubation top and intubation bottom. So intubation top contains your surgical airway kit with a bougie. You're going to have a Miller. You're going to have a Macintosh blade and handle. You're going to have tape. You're going to have a 14 gauge chest dart. You're going to have a 10 milliliter syringe. And then you're going to have a stylet. Everybody okay there? The surgical fright kit, labeled fright, and you'll see that this kit will contain a cut down 6OET tube, tape, some uh, four by fours, a scalpel, and tracheal hooks. All right, in addition to that, you will have a bougie here, and you've got your inline suction here. Everybody see that there, your valid suction for after the intubation. Is everybody okay there? Oh, sweet. All right. Intubation bottom. Intubation bottom contains endotracheal tubes, a tube tamer, and another bougie. Everybody okay there? All right. And then, and then finally, the far back, you have RSI top. This is going to contain labels. So you can label your drugs when you draw them up. And uh, there will be a Sharpie in here as well. Um, in addition to that, you're going to have your RSI kit that contains the frontline RSI drugs, the induction agents and the parallels. Inside of the kit, 
you're going to have 10 milliliters of normal saline. And what you do is you inject that 10 milliliters of normal saline into this 10 milligram vial of vecuronium if you want to use vecuronium as your paralytic. You have got atomidate, you've got rock uronium, um, you've got ketamine, you've got succinylcholine, you've got midazolam, you've got a milligram of atropine, 100 milligrams of lidocaine, syringes and needles, all contained within this kit. Does that make sense? Get back in. And then you have RSI Clotum, which contains your IV supplies and uh, remember your fluids are in the other bag. So you've got drip kits, you've got angiocatheters, you've got your sharps container, you've got alcohol wipes, you've got additional syringes and needles, star kits, and this is where the epinephrine will be for mixing your push dose epinephrine. So let me ask you all a question. Does it sound like you have everything you need in this kit? Is there a head? Is there absolutely something that you that has to go in here? Option. We'll have oxygen. Yeah. Well, the oxygen is not there. Right? Got your carbon dioxide detection as well. That's in there. What's that? So you got everything you need, right? Mm -hmm. with that. So really at this point, it's just a matter of taking some time today to familiarize yourself with the equipment and to kind of sandbox and dry run some situations, some scenarios and situations. Now, let me ask you a question. If you have enough concerns when you're doing your airway assessments, an obese patient has a big old mass in their neck, um, do you reserve the right to say, I don't think RSI is appropriate for this patient? Yes. Absolutely, right? And then you have to go, okay, what are some other options at this point? Might it be simply going to a surgical airway? Um, that might be, right? You remember back in airway, um, and, uh, airway, uh, airway and pulmonology, I had a, a couple of videos of patients who were awake where they criped them, right? And it was, you know, obese and had some other things going on. And it was actually on, on BiPAP, right? And they just kept the patient on BiPAP, gave them a little ketamine, and just did an awake cripe because that was the safest option given what was going on in the patient and all the different um, risk factors. Because at this point, let me ask you all a question. At this point, are you expert intubators? Yeah. But everybody's had the opportunity to innovate. Yeah, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Don't give me that. Don't you be little, Chris. No, no, I'm not belittling anybody. It's just, you know, it, it, it just is what it is. You got to think about, okay, you know, I have a few tubes under my belt, and I have this really complex patient. How comfortable do I feel? Maybe there are some better options. Maybe not. Maybe RSI is the best option. Um, and that's just a conversation you have to have. And the good thing is, if you're thinking about RSI, you. You, you should have a patient that has some time. Because if you don't have time, then you're not dealing with this here, right? You're dealing something else. You're dealing with this, or maybe a failed airway, right? You're not dealing with this, hey, what are some of these other options I can think about? Everybody, everybody okay there? All right, any questions? Now, to make it even more complicated, you're also gonna have to integrate this into or you might have to integrate this into a patient situation, right? So I don't want you to come away thinking tomorrow is just RSI. Like, oh, we're talking about RSI, so the goal for tomorrow is to RSI the patient. You're gonna have a real, per well, a simulated person, and that person's gonna have some sort of problem, right? And so you gotta think about that as well, right? Like when you walk through the, the doorway, it's not RSI, 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 it's okay, what do we got? What's going on here, right? And you kind of start from the beginning. So you're gonna have a situation like that, right? It's gonna be a patient that's gonna have some medical or traumatic uh, situation, and you're gonna have to be addressing that, and RSI might be a tool that you use in the overall management of that patient. Does that, does that kind of make sense? So for tomorrow, we are going to assume that 
you all have protocols and scope of practice that allows you to do these more advanced procedures. Because I understand that for many of us, RSI is just not quite, is not going to be available at the introductory level. But tomorrow is more about letting you guys have some practice with more complex decision making and more complex scenarios. So is everybody okay there? Okay, so with that in mind, let's talk about what's gonna to happen tonight. Tonight's gonna to be a lot of fun. But there's gonna be some suspension of disbelief that's gonna to happen tonight, all right? So I am going to say certain things to you all. I'm gonna do certain things to you all. That you oh, uh, uh, these will so not be grossly unethical, okay? I will not do anything grossly unethical. But I am going to say and do things that um, might, might not seem obvious to you, right? I might say, hey, you can't do this here. You're like, well, the hell I can't. This is exactly what I do. And, I'm, and I might say, no, you just can't. Right? You just can't do this right now. Or you have to do this, right? I may put you in a situation where, well, that's not what I want to do. Tough. You have to do this, right? So the goal for tonight is, is, is not hyper-realistic. <laughs> It's not like hyper realistic in the that I want to see what exactly you would do, but I want to see if I constrain you in certain ways, right? I constrain you, I inhibit your ability to do something, or I I change the environment um, markedly. I want to see, okay, how do you how do you respond? How do you work as a team? How do you overcome the various obstacles that you're going to encounter? Um, so there are going to be sights and sounds and possibly things that you feel that are going to be um, a little discombobulating potentially, so just kind of keep that in, in, in mind. Um, so are there any questions about that? All right. Everybody okay there? So I am going to, um, I am going to prime you to think about um, a scenario tonight. So here's the situation, right? So this is a, think of this as a pre-briefing, right? So I'm gonna pre-brief you all um, for a scenario that may or may not happen in the future. 